Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. We're just glad you're able to be here. During today's webinar, Financial Wellbeing for Individuals with Disabilities During the Pandemic and Beyond, we're really excited to be introducing you to a new online financial toolkit. Today's webinar is hosted by the LEAD Center, which stands for Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities. And for those of you who may be new to the LEAD Center, we are a Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA, Policy Development Center. LEAD Center is led by Social Policy Research Associates and National Disability Institute, and it is funded by the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor. So as you will so soon learn, the online financial toolkit has been developed to provide job seekers with disabilities, as well as staff in the workforce system with critical financial literacy tools throughout the stages in the work life cycle. And that includes preparing for a job, starting a job, maintaining a job, changing or losing a job, and retiring from a job. And this has been a wonderful collaboration, a labor of love, if you will, of the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy and Employee Benefit Security Administration. The toolkit also includes resource contributions from other federal partners, which you will learn a little bit more about once we get started. Next slide so that everyone can fully participate in today's webinar we'd like to take a moment to share some captioning and housekeeping tips first captioning today's webinar is live captioned if you would like to hide options hide captions click the live transcript button to find the hide captions option you can also adjust the caption size under the subtitle settings option you also have the option to open the captioning webpage in a new browser. The link has been posted in the chat box. You can adjust the background color, text color, and font using the drop down menus at the top of the browser. Position the window to sit on top of the embedded captioning. Next slide. Second, we're going to talk about questions and technical support. If you have content questions for panelists during this webinar, and we really do encourage you to ask them, please type them into the Q&A panel, and we will save time at the end for questions and answers. <clears throat> if your question is not content related, for example, you need tech support, use the chat box instead. Next slide, please. <clears throat> My name is Laura Glenick, and I'm delighted to be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, as I mentioned at the opening, the creation of the Financial Toolkit has truly been a wonderful collaboration of the U.S. Department of Labor with contributions of many other federal partners. We are very honored to have three representatives from the Department of Labor joining us today to provide a welcome to help us mark the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act and to help launch the Financial Toolkit. Our first welcome is from the Secretary of Labor, Martin Walsh, who is with the Office of the Secretary at the U.S. Department of Labor. It is my pleasure to welcome Secretary Walsh. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning into this important webinar. And thank you to all the staff who put it together. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed 31 years ago on July 26, 1990. As you know, it's a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination based on disability. And it's one of the most significant laws ever enacted in our country. I saw that up close when I was mayor of Boston. I worked with our disability community and drew on the ADAs to tear down barriers and increase access, equity, and inclusion all across our city. 
It's also important law here at the Department of Labor. The ADA prohibits discrimination in several areas, including employment. And an important goal of the ADA is to advance economic self-sufficiency. Full access to employment creates independence. It fosters full participation in the fabric of our nation, and it strengthens our economy. Economic empowerment also requires financial literacy. All of us can benefit from a better understanding how to advance financially to be secure. Folks with disabilities face challenges in getting access to information tailored to their needs and protecting their rights and interests. That's why I'm excited to launch our new resource, Secure Your Financial Future, a toolkit for individuals with disabilities. The toolkit offers resources to help people answer key financial questions throughout their career journey. Anyone who relies on ADA protection can tell you implementing this law has always been a work in progress. Coming out of the pandemic that hit people with disabilities hard, we need to build back better and do better. Each of us has a role to play in fulfilling ADA's promise. We take that seriously at the Department of Labor. It's time to focus more than ever on economic advancement for people with disabilities. This toolkit provides resources to empower people and help make that happen. So I wanna thank you for your interest in your partnership and I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you, Secretary Walsh. Joining us now from the Employee Benefit Security Administration, I would like to welcome Ali Kawar, who serves as the Acting Assistant Secretary. Thank you for joining us today, Ali. I will turn it over to you to provide a welcome. Thanks, Laura. Um, and I'm delighted to be here with Secretary Walsh, um, Deputy Assistant Secretary Sheehy, and, and all of you. Uh, because this toolkit is something that we are very excited about at EPSA, and um, I really think it, it is a, a tremendous thing that we've been able to um, accomplish that is really going to make a tremendous difference in, in people's lives. So, so maybe I'll, I'll just start, for those of you that aren't even familiar with EPSA, so the Employee Benefits Security Administration is the agency in the Department of Labor that is charged with protecting people's employee benefits. Uh, what that means is that if you're in the private sector and you have health insurance or you have uh, 401k, for example, through your employer, um, we're the agency that is, um, is predominantly charged with protecting those benefits. Uh, most people probably are more familiar with uh, some of the laws that we enforce uh, that aren't called ERISA, uh, the Affordable Care Act, HIPAA, COBRA, those are all part of what we do. Um, and I mentioned 401ks in the retirement context, we are really focused on improving uh, individuals' financial security. And financial literacy is a critical part of that. We do work with an organization, a uh, federal organization called the uh, Financial Literacy Education Council, which is really focused on improving financial literacy across the country. But for us, saving for retirement is obviously a critical focus of our work. Um, there are any number of reasons why it's important to save for retirement. Uh, if you have the opportunity, you have um, tax advantages, you have the advantage of a long period of time, which means your money can grow um, in a very significant way. And those long-term savings are really designed to be there for you when you've reached that, uh, that twilight of your career um, and you're ready to begin that next phase of life. At the same time, retirement saving is one just one part of someone's overall financial health. And we recognize that talking about retirement savings can't really occur in a vacuum. And so really there's a fundamental need for all workers um, to have help in, in making better uh, employment decisions and financial decisions um, across the board. I think uh, you know, the experience of COVID has really reinforced that message at the same time that it's, it's made some certain fundamental changes to the economic landscape that again, we need to take into account. Now, as we um, all know, we're uh, celebrating the anniversary of the ADA. And uh, for those of you that saw the proclamation that came out of the White House, uh, you know, there are four fundamental rights um, that that proclamation identified. Uh, the fundamental right of people with disabilities to um, equal opportunity, economic self-sufficiency, independent living, and equitable participation in every aspect of American life. 
and and really we think that this toolkit is an important way of um, making sure that those those the promise of those rights is met because whether you are um, as Laura mentioned at any stage of these these work life events uh, preparing to start a job um, starting a job maintaining a job changing or losing a job or retirement your need for clear and accurate information doesn't really change. And this toolkit provides easy to use information and tools that can help um, anyone that's dealing with any of those work life cycle events, and particularly those who have been impacted by COVID. Uh, so we're, again, very excited about this resource. We think it has a lot of uh, utility uh, for people, um, and we are very excited about it in part because we think the more information that people have, the better prepared they are for their career and uh, ultimately for their financial security. Now, there are a number of uh, distinguished speakers that will be leading you through the slide um, and answering your questions. And I'll turn it over to Laura to introduce our speakers. Um, but thank you again for joining and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Ali. Next slide, please. <clears throat> For our final welcome on the launch of the new online financial toolkit, I will turn it over to the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Disability Employment Policy, Jennifer Sheehy. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Jennifer, to share a few opening words. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for your long-term partnership with the Office of Disability Employment Policy. And uh, I want to thank our Policy Development Center that has worked with us hand in hand uh, to release many hopefully useful tools for Americans with disabilities. Thank you, of course, to our Acting Assistant Secretary Ali Kawar and your team for your partnership with ODEP in developing and releasing this toolkit today. This is one of the many fruitful outcomes from our longstanding relationship with EPSA to advance economic advancement for people with disabilities and marginalized communities. We're proud to work together on behalf of Americans with disabilities. We intentionally released this toolkit today in the uh, general area of the 31st anniversary of the ADA, which was yesterday. Economic advancement is one of the foundational goals of the ADA, and we've made advances towards that goal and towards financial freedom, but it still eludes too many people with disabilities. As our country works through and recovers from the pandemic, ODEP is implementing policies and programs that will help America, America recover into inclusion, as we, as we put it. We wanna make sure the recovery is inclusive from the outset, from the beginning. We are actively working to ensure that individuals with disabilities are part of that recovery and can take advantage and enjoy full economic empowerment. We look forward to the opportunity that the toolkit will create for individuals with disabilities. And we will be releasing two new tools every quarter. In fact, we will be launching a national online dialogue on the toolkit to engage stakeholders uh, on the different pieces of the toolkit and your experiences on October 18th. You will learn more about it uh, if you follow us on our Policy Development Center, and we hope you can join us. Once again, thank you to EPSA, to our Policy Development Center, and to our expert Office of Disability Employment Policy staff that worked on this toolkit and the webinar. Back to you, Laura. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, a special thank you to all of you for joining us. Next slide, please. Uh, for Secretary Walsh, Assist Assistant Secretary Kalar, and Deputy Assistant Secretary Sheehy for opening today's webinar and sharing such powerful messages in honor of the 31st anniversary of the ADA and really the importance of what this toolkit is founded on and, and the foundation of it. And not only the toolkit, 
market, but what's to come in the future. You've really helped to add to the excitement and anticipation. So we're going to move into today's presentation. It's time. Um, and it's going to feature three presenters that will include Andy Arias, Policy Advisor with the Office of Disability Employment Policy with the U.S. Department of Labor, Nancy Buteau, Subject Matter Expert on Financial Empowerment with the LEAD WIOA Policy Development Center, and Edward Mitchell, our special guest today, who is part of the Achieving a Better Life Experience or ABLE National Resource Center, Black, Indigenous, or Other People of Color, BIPOC, BIPOC Ambassador Program, and much more, as you will soon learn. So since Andy, Nancy, and Edward are going to introduce you to the financial toolkit through an engaging dialogue, pulling from both professional and personal lived experiences in this area, I thought it might be nice to have each of them share a little bit more about their background. So Andy, we're going to start with you, then turn to Nancy, and end by learning a little bit more about Edward. So I'll turn to you first, Andy. Hi, thank you, Laura, and thank you, everyone. It was such a pleasure to hear from both secretaries and Secretary Walsh. Uh, my name is Andy Arias, and just a visual description. I'm wearing a blue polka dot dress shirt, a sparkly background, and I have gold highlights in my hair. Uh, just so everyone knows, I am also Latinx and I identify uh, as LGBTQ or queer as well. Um, and I think it's really important to have those identification markers because we kept BIPOC communities uh, in the focus of developing this toolkit. I myself grew up in systemic poverty, so all my work experience has really been pushing towards economic advancement for individuals with disabilities, either through my local work, and now I have the pleasure of working with the Office of Disability Employment Policy on WIOA implementation and now economic advancement and financial literacy for individuals with disabilities. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Nancy Buteau. Thank you so much, Andy. Hi, everyone. I'm Nancy Buteau. Uh, a little description of myself. I am a white woman in my mid-50s. I have uh, straight brown hair. I wear black glasses. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm sitting in my home office wearing a uh, blue dress and a blue striped scarf. Uh, so I have been in the field of disability and employment for a very long time, starting out as a job coach way back in 1991. Uh, I have lived experience with mental health that I occasionally blog about, uh, as well as speak um, about at conferences. I am a benefits planner, as well as a financial coach. And like Andy, I was born into poverty, but was lucky enough uh, to, to not grow up in poverty, um, but, but do have that, that experience. And I'm just so happy to be here today. So thank you. And with that, I want to uh, pass it along to my colleague, Edward Mitchell. Good afternoon. Um, I am, my name is Edward Mitchell. I am a African-American male. I am wearing a yellow shirt, um, a small Afro with glasses and my backdrop is of Lane College, a HBCU in Jackson, Tennessee. Um, I am currently serving at working as a independent living specialist for a Center for Independent Living here in Jackson, Tennessee. I also am a fans relations coordinator for a AA minor league baseball team. I sit on two different gubernatorial boards here in Tennessee and my hit and run accident, call, a hit and run accident caused my disability. I was hit from behind by a truck in 2003 and left with a spinal cord injury. I finished my, uh, my undergrad degree from Lane College at HBCU in 2009 and followed it up with a MBA. I'm also a active member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And in 2018, I uh, testified before a Washington DC Senate Special Committee on Aging. And I am a recent award winner of the Jefferson Award here in Jackson, Tennessee. And I'll just look forward to presenting to you. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. So you can see why we're so excited about our presenters today who bring, again, personal and uh, professional lived experience. So we'll go to the next slide, please. In a few minutes, Nancy and Edward and Andy will be introducing you to the new online financial toolkit, which we keep talking about, uh, which was developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic for people that are experiencing new levels of financial stress and unemployment. The toolkit, as I previously mentioned, provides both job seekers with disabilities as well as staff in the workforce system with critical financial literacy considerations throughout the work life cycle. So after today's session, you will understand how you can support others or yourself to prepare financially for a job access resources to help set financial goals, maintain a job while working from home, work towards promotions, start preparing for retirement, among many other COVID-19 financial literacy related considerations. Nancy, I'm going to move to sharing the PowerPoint, to sharing the financial toolkit live. And while I do, I'm going to turn it to you to get us started by providing an overview. Thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate that. Well, welcome everybody to the Secure Your Financial Future a Toolkit for Persons with Disabilities website. Yay! We've been talking about it for 20 minutes. Now we get to see it. So um, we all know that the pandemic has disrupted uh, the personal finances of many Americans. As a result, large numbers of people, including those with disabilities, are making employment-related decisions based on their new financial situation. You may be one of those individuals or you may be serving folks in that category. Uh, so to provide job seekers with disabilities and staff in the workforce development system with uh, critical financial tools, we have developed this online financial toolkit to use throughout the stages in a person's work life cycle. And today we're gonna to walk you through the website and we're gonna talk about those work life cycles in a little more depth. Um, I wanna first take a few moments um, and start off by giving you a general overview of the website. And then we'll go into more specifics on how we get to resources um, and how the categories are broken down. So there are several ways to use the website. Um, so as you can see, we are on the homepage here. You see an African-American woman. She looks like she's leaning against a door jam and she's wearing a mask. And um, to the left of that, you see a get started button. So if you click on that blue button on the home screen on the left, boom, right? It immediately takes you to the five work lifestyle life cycle categories, um, as you can see here, and you've already heard, right? Preparing for a job, starting a job, maintaining a job, changing or losing a job, and retiring from a job. And before we go on, I just want to point out that there, there's nothing out there like this. This toolkit was developed to assist people with disabilities who need tools and resources due to the difficulties that they may be facing because of the pan pandemic. And its focus is on financial capability and employment throughout all the stages of a person's work life cycle. The economic journey is too often overlooked when we are working with individuals with barriers to employment. The other thing that I'm really proud of having here is the retirement bucket. Um, you know, this is, I think, a, a very overlooked part of planning when we are assisting individuals with disabilities in terms of long-term goals. So very happy to, to have that uh, here. All right, so I wanna show you another way that you can access these five buckets. And that's simply just scrolling down on the homepage. So you're on the homepage, rather than clicking the get started, you just scroll down and there you are. And then you can click any of the, um, the categories, which you're gonna hear me say buckets because that's what we call them behind the scenes. Um, so let's click on preparing for a job bucket, and you'll see what I mean a little bit. So 
Once you're in your preferred area of content, you will see on the left hand side, as well as at the bottom of the page, that resources are broken down by publications, tools, websites, and videos. You know, when I say that we have done what we think, um, everything in our power, everything that we could think of to make this a really user friendly website, um, we believe it's true. But of course, we want feedback from, from you all on that as well. Um, but the thing that I really like about this part is if you're specifically looking for something, if you're specifically looking for a video or a publication, you would just click right there on whatever um, you're looking for. So that's one other um, friendly piece to the website. The other thing is you can search by key terms. So as you scroll down, you can look at key terms that you can search for. Um, so again, there's so many easy ways that you can web use the website and look at all those um, key terms. And then let's scroll back up on publications in this clicking for uh, preparing for a job bucket. And I'll show you a little bit how that works. So there you will see um, in this situation, you'll see four publications that relate to securing a financial future as it relates to preparing for a job. So again, really easy to navigate. Uh, if we scroll back up, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the five work life cycle categories there as well, along with the option to do a search. So let's do a search um, for the fun of it and put in the word budget, right? Because again, this website is a financial toolkit during a person's work lifestyle, work life cycle. And here we see several resources that relate to creating a budget financial planning worksheets, and much more. It's important to note here that when you do this search, all of the resources that show up are located in this toolkit, okay? So you're not gonna encounter ads or firewalls or anything like that. And as you can see, when you're looking here, 38 results came up. Um, and up top, you can also refine your search um, in terms of what you're looking for. So um, if we go back to the home screen, um, I'll show you one last feature of the toolkit. And that is, um, we also have a wonderful frequently asked questions section in each cycle. So let me show you that now, um, as I have the pleasure of showing you the first bucket, which is preparing for a job. So the resources in the preparing for a job bucket are for people of all ages looking for a first job and those who, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, are also looking perhaps for a new job. So to prepare for a job, it's useful for an individual to consider um, important things like their budget, what level of earnings does somebody need, the impact that work will have on any public benefits that they receive. So each section has this frequently asked questions. Um, so you see here the frequently asked questions for this specific bucket is, how can I prepare for a job? Can I work and receive SSI or SSDI? And how do I connect with people who can help me find a job? So if we expand these, you'll see that under each FAQ, we have several different um, resources that we can look at. So in this situation, let's look at credit score. Credit score is so important, more important than we realize. So in this instance, the link takes you to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's website. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with CFPB, it's a wonderful website um, with a tremendous amount of information. So here, what we're showing you is information on credit, such as what is a credit score? How is a credit score determined um, by your credit report? How are credit scores calculated? Examples of how lenders may pull your credit report and actually see different scores. This can be really confusing to individuals. 
So we know that some employers also do credit score checks as part of the hiring process. Um, and really anyone can benefit from knowing more about their credit score and the importance of a good credit score. So that's why I wanted to show you this specific link, um, since it's definitely attached to, um, to, to helping people get um, employment. So let's go back now to um, the frequently asked questions. And um, with that, I will um, look to my colleagues, Andy, Edward, do either of you have any comment on the preparing for a job uh, life cycle bucket? Yes, I do, Nancy. Um, such great buckets and just usefulness from the field would be, you know, probably something that a debit card versus a credit card, because those can be very mystifying, especially for those that are trying to, you know, begin their career and just kind of demystifying what's the difference between a credit card and a debit card and how both are equally good, but, you know, one is not like the other. Thank you so much, Edward. I appreciate that. Uh, all right, well then with that, I am now going to turn it over to Andy to introduce our next work life cycle. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Nancy. What a great kickoff and how exciting to ring in 8831 with such a great financial tool. I agree with Nancy's statements around building credit. Uh, credit can successfully open doors for you that have previously been closed. And just a little story about me, since I've been monitoring my credit and using some tools that you would find in the toolkit, I have the last three apartments that I've received. I didn't need a cosigner because my credit score was so good and it was building because um, because I've utilized these tools to take advantage of that. So that's great. And having a credit score can help you in so many different ways. Uh, buying a house, uh, getting a car, or even getting your dream job. So I'm going to go over starting a job. But before I do that, I want to mention um, starting a job is exciting and earning a paycheck is great but earning a paycheck is so much more than just paying bills it can give you a sense of self and purpose and provide you with the stability to move forward and achieve your goals this toolkit like was stated before is about your work work life cycle. And that goes side by side with your financial health. I know it's weird, right, how those two things come together, but finding the right job is so important. And there are so many things to consider. That could be accommodations, that could be a work-life balance, but also setting up some financial goals to make sure that the transition for benefits and services that you have as somebody with a disability, you're able to transition nicely. Um, so these are some of the things that are gonna be highlighted inside the tool, this toolkit. And I wanna talk a little bit about uh, setting financial goals. So to review, so we're gonna click on financial goals and it's also gonna take you again to CFPB, uh, they have a huge toolkit that is very useful. But right now we're going to talk about some of the money, their uh, smart goals uh, toolkit that they have. And that has specific things that we're gonna go over. Uh, it helps you prioritize your financial values, what you're looking for, and has a step-by-step -step process so you can look at your goals, um, whether they be small or large. It provides you step-by-step -step instructions on how to put your goals into actions, and it gives you resources to achieve these goals. So it also helps you develop a timeline and gives you checkpoints for accountability. So these are just some of the things that you're able to find through the setting smart goals tool. Um, and CFPB has been a 
great resource, but I would have never been able to sort of consolidate everything that CFPB and other tools that we're going to go over have to offer without uh, the resource of this toolkit. Also in this section, you'll get some information about revising your goals, because as we know, life can change on a dime, and this last year has been proof of that. So we want to make sure that these financial tools speak to you. Um, so if you have a chance, check out CFPB, because they have so many other resources that can help you uh, move forward. So I am also gonna go over some items for you before I pass it over to Nancy. So job accommodations are another thing that you have to consider. And um, we at ODEP have the pleasure of running the Job Accommodation Network. Now the Job Accommodation Network has so many resources for individuals with disabilities when you're getting into the workforce and how to ask for an accommodation. Now, I want to be clear, you are not liable to disclose your disability to an employer at any time. Although, if you disclose your disability, that may help with providing some of those accommodations that you may need. It also has lots of resources for employers to help them understand what an accommodation is and how to move forward with their employers with disabilities. So please check out that. And then I want to say uh, if Nancy and Edward, do you have any comments on what we just covered? Hey Andy, um, yeah, I actually do. Uh, so thanks for giving me a moment here. Uh, great information. I, I love that bucket. Um, it's so exciting, um, you know, when, when people start um, a job for the first time. I wanted to point out, I saw it in the FAQ section, um, that there's, um, what we introduce here in this section is resources on retirement. As you can tell, I'm pretty happy about retirement. Um, when you start a job, it's also a great time to start contributing to a retirement account. So I just love that we've started talking about retirement early on in uh, when we're just talking about starting a job, because really that's when we should start saving for retirement. So I really like the way this toolkit is laid out. I just wanted to say that. Thanks. I really appreciate that and thank you for your contributions. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to you to talk about maintaining a job. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to talk about maintaining a job. So as we all know, the longer someone works for an organization, the more likely they are to have a chance to receive a raise, pursue a promotion. Um, maybe people start thinking about buying a home uh, it could be that an individual may also be experiencing new needs for accommodations. So um, this section of the toolkit provides resources on that specific area of maintaining a job. So here in the frequently asked questions section, we have, will a raise or promotion impact my SSI, SSDI, or Medicaid benefits? How can I maintain my job working from home? And can I use my ABLE account for things I buy to go to work? So if we expand those, um, let's look at a couple of resources here. So first, let's look at the very important question, will a raise or a promotion impact my SSI, SSDI, or Medicaid? And let's click on Employment Supports and Work Incentives. So this brings us to one of my favorite resources, the Social Security Administration Red Book. Um, uh, it's actually behind me. You can't see it, but if you see a plant behind me, behind the plant sits the SSA Red Book. Um, I, I think it's a, a wonderful tool that I've been using for many, many years. It really does a great job of breaking down employment supports offered by SSA and it serves as a terrific resource uh, and source of information about employment related provisions regarding social security disability benefits 
And it's for everybody. It's for educators, it's for advocates, it's for rehab professionals and counselors who serve people with disabilities. So as you can see here, it breaks things down. We see um, things broken down by SSDI supports, SSI supports, um, but what I'd like to show you real quick is let's look at a guide to employment supports. And I'm not going to go through all of these here, but there are close to 20 supports listed that you can look at depending on the benefit you receive or the benefit of the person that you're assisting receives and what your employment and financial goals are. So just a tremendous amount of information. Um, the Red Book is really also um, written in a user-friendly, reader-friendly manner. So um, it's, it's just a wonderful resource. And um, in this bucket, I want to show you one more resource um, under maintaining a job. And, you know, because of the pandemic, many people had to start working from their homes. So um, there is a resource on um, tips for being an effective teleworker. And this is from Pete Works. And I really like these tips for being an effective teleworker. Um, it gives you information on creating a comfortable workplace, evaluating your accommodation needs now that you might be working from home, keeping a routine, which I think some of us have struggled with um, during the pandemic, uh, connecting with colleagues, something else that changed a lot when people started working from home, and then staying productive and balanced. Um, so those last three, keeping a routine, connecting with colleagues, staying productive and balanced, that was really difficult for many people. So I think these are really great tips. Um, and I think all of us could have used these, you know, back in 2020. But the important point is they are still so relevant today. So I really like that resource as well. And I just wanted to point it out to you. Um, so uh, Andy? Or uh, Edward, um, any other comments related to this um, bucket? I actually have a comment, Nancy. I think it's so important to, um, I want to talk a little bit about because this toolkit and these resources, as much as they have that aspect of uh, all the things and all the information that they have inside them, there also is an important value to bringing your whole self to work and really having that balance, right? And these tools can help you achieve that. I, I do want to mention that even though these resources are from other websites, the way we've tried to design them is so that you can use them and personalize them to your own uh, needs and and sort of see yourself mirrored in, in the resources and how you can use them. That, yeah, that's very true. Thank you, Andy. Um, well, you might as well just keep your mic on, Andy, because I'm gonna turn it over to you to uh, start talking about um, the next bucket, changing or losing a job. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Laura. And, um, Thank you, Nancy. Uh, you're doing a great job. So I definitely want to talk about changing or losing a job. Many of us experience a time where we change or lose a job. Uh, you may be among those people that have been uh, affected by uh, the pandemic and have lost your job due to that or some other reason. So changing a job it can happen for a variety of, of reasons. And for this, uh, in this section, you will find uh, answers to some of your questions and some resources that will help you through that. Um, I look at your career and jobs as building blocks, right? They're skills that you build with each job that carry over. And I definitely think that that also goes in hand um, with financial literacy. So if you build those blocks together, you can uh, increase your experience, but also increase your value to your employer. And I think that these tools can help you achieve some of those goals. 
So I definitely wanna talk about a few of the FAQs. So one of the FAQs says, should I tell Social Security Administration if I lose my job or income? The answer here is yes. Keeping Social Security representatives informed of what you're doing in the employment sphere is so important. Um, and that goes for your other service providers as well. I'll give Laura a second. And here you'll see a blog that gives you a little bit more information and provides you links to uh, the Social Security website where they have a bunch of online tools that can help you through this transition. I would also like to mention that ODEP has a strong relationship with SSA, which is the Social Security Administration. And we're constantly working to achieve uh, deeper career pathways uh, for those on Social Security benefits to help them achieve uh, not only um, a career, but economic advancement as well. So that's really important. Um, so I would say also, I want to click on another FAQ. If I lost my job, what do I do about health care? So I want to say first and foremost, if you lose your job and you have a significant disability, you may qualify for Medicaid. So I want to make sure that that's really important. And so um, I'll give it a moment. I, Laura, I think you clicked on that. Yes, right there, perfect. Sorry, there we go. And here you will see a whole list of resources that will provide you um, some examples of what to do if you lose your health insurance. I put Medicaid at the very top of my speaking points because we're speaking about individuals with disabilities and that's really important. Also, if you go to health.gov, you can explore um, some of your states may have an open enrollment program. So it really depends on how you want to structure your health benefits, but you may be able to explore that as well. Also, COBRA has temporary, um, they have temporary extended health coverage programs that you may want to look at so you can keep your health um, insurance from a previous employer. I would like to say that all these um, depend on your state and so it's not a, a national resource. So I would check with your state and your um, for your eligibility. So there's also information on job loss through the Department of Labor's website. So please check those out and make sure that you get informed and in things that work for you. Now, I also want to ask Nancy and Edward if they have anything to contribute in this section. Thank you, Andy. I certainly do. Um, these buckets and this great website takes the stigma out of losing the job. I myself have been a, am an individual with a disability and I've gone through a job change and a job loss and exploring these different buckets and the different tabs really takes the sting and the stigma out of losing a job and knowing what the next steps are. Back to you, Andy. Thank you. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Nancy to introduce you to her favorite topic, retiring from a job. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> For those of you, you know, in the very beginning, or if you got here a little late, I described myself as a uh, middle-aged um, woman. So of course I have retiring um, on the brain, right? Um, I'm sure some of you out there do too. So I love this picture, first of all. Let's just look at this picture for a second. So um, we see a older woman, you know, of retirement age-ish. Um, actually, she looks a little young to me. She's got short gray hair and she's wearing a bright yellow sweater, but she's doing this fist pump, you know, like, yes. Um, so I really, I really like that picture. And I think, um, I think it would be wonderful if um, everybody was able to um, celebrate retirement uh, the way it's, it's shown in this picture. 
But honestly, planning for retirement can come with a lot of questions. And I think when we, uh, I think we tend not to think about people with disabilities retiring. But yes, people with disabilities do retire and they do need to plan. So if we look at the frequently asked questions in this um, retirement section, we'll see um, where can I learn more about my pension, 401k, or individual retirement account, IRA? What are 401k plan fees and who pays for them? And the third question, I'm close to retirement, but I'm concerned that I have not saved enough. What can I do? So let's look um, under, I'm close to retirement, but I'm concerned that I have not saved enough. What can I do? And let's look at savings matters. So here, what you're going to see is information for people nearing retirement. Lots of helpful tips on how to prepare when there's little time. And I think this is important because people may be unsure if they have saved enough money for retirement. We want people to access this information so retirement can be an exciting time of new beginnings. Uh, but to me, in order for that to happen, people have to start planning early. However, what I like here is even if you don't start planning early, it doesn't mean that, um, that you, you can't um, retire. It just means you have to maybe put a few other things in place. So I just want to point out the box below what we were just looking at that Laura is highlighting. Um, the resources in this box have wonderful, useful information, um, interactive worksheets, things that can help you see if your retirement savings are on track. There's something called taking the mystery out of retirement planning. I love that one. It's got a big um, um, looking glass. Wow, I am sounding like I'm ready to retire. A big uh, magnifying glass um, on the front cover. Uh, in addition, there's a retirement toolkit. And lastly, um, you can look at something called Savings Fitness, a guide for your money and your financial future. So these are great tools. All of them are from the Employee Benefit Security Administration, EBSA. You heard from Ollie earlier. And I will tell you the honest truth, I have used every single one of these tools. So um, I, I like them, I think they're great, and I think they're very useful. So, so yes, as, as Andy said, I'm, I'm a little happy when I talk about retirement. Um, and uh, so yeah, Andy or Edward, do either of you have any um, thoughts or comments on um, the, the retirement bucket? I actually do, um, you know, when I first started my career, which wasn't that long ago, I thought retirement wasn't something I would ever achieve. And I really think that looking at this, these resources and talking with you, Nancy, and really looking at all the resources that EPSA has to offer, I reframed that thinking, right? Because retirement really helps you provide for your future. And as we know, this last year has been so, this last year and a half has been so interesting for many of us. And so I've really been thinking on how can I secure myself beyond my career, right? Because I don't want to be working when I'm, you know, over 75 or, or even close to 80. And so I really think that this toolkit is framing disability in a new way for the new generation of people with disabilities. So I'm really excited about this. I'm gonna dive into this section um, so much and uh, I appreciate it. Thanks, Andy. Um, thanks for that, I appreciate it. All right, so I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Edward who is going to share his uh, insights from the field. Thank you, Nancy. I want to thank, I first want to thank ODEP, the Lead Center, and ABLE for collaborating on such an intuitive website. 
speaking from my own experience, I've had to reinvent myself several times um, going through the work life buckets of preparing for a job, starting a job, maintaining a job and changing and or losing a job. This website encompasses everything an individual with a disability will encounter. This is only the beginning of this website as it will grow. And a few things that I would love to see added would be in one of the buckets would be something on career planning and placement offices at colleges, because sometimes these can be overlooked. Um, I've worked in higher ed and again, you know, referring individuals back to these career planning and placement offices can be quite beneficial. Another great thing to be add in would be something on maintaining and preparing the LinkedIn. Um, another great useful tool would be what is a scheduled aid letter and possibly even a link back to usajob.gov. As well as, you know, on the different buckets, maybe a, a former or current employee going through those preparing a job, starting a job, maintaining a job. And one of the things that's also very helpful is having individuals relate back to joining a professional organization such as me. I'm a member of the National Black MBA Association and it's dedicated to the enhancement and development of educational and economic empowerment. And they have career fairs where over 300 in, uh, jobs come out, companies come out and you can actually obtain a career or get a job offer there. This toolkit allows individuals with disabilities a path to asset development. Asset development is a series of, strategic, of strategies that provide long-term benefits and have potential to help people with disabilities improve their economic status, expand opportunities for their community, for their community participation, and positively impact their quality of life. And these assets need to be defined because, again, an individual with a disability, knowing what their 401k is, what an IRA is, these are things that they need to know as they're going through these buckets. And why asset development is important to people with disabilities is asset development helps create more opportunities for greater independence and financial security. Access, uh, access, access to assets allows greater choices in the community, participation and quality of life and supports inclusion and self-determination. And asset development can produce opportunities that directly impact the individual's quality of life, including their mental and physical health, self-concept, as well as the level of community participation. This, for me, as you see from these pictures, my, the current asset that I've recently achieved is purchasing my 2020 Honda Odyssey Elite. Um, the cost of a vehicle with modification is in excess over $115,000. While I was able to get some help from vocational rehabilitation on the modification, the vehicle itself fell squarely on my shoulders and the vehicle was over $55,000. While I'll typically hear a gasp, minivans aren't cheap and it stresses an individual with a disability to come up with these figures. Um, individuals must be committed to these vehicles because you keep them for over 10 plus years, no matter what happens. On top of owning a wheelchair accessible vehicle comes the maintenance on it and even going beyond and obtaining an extended warranty, not only on the OEM side, but also the mobility conversion. And all that falls directly on an individual's shoulders. This is a true asset because it allows me to continue to work as well as being active in the community. And I couldn't have done this without the help of my ABLE account, as I am on a Tennessee Choices waiver that helps with my nursing care at night. On my development of asset development, I plan on obtaining a accessible home, and that is the next big accomplishment. Um, it's been a pleasure living with my parents and getting to know them more in my adult life, but owning a home and being independent is where I want to be. With my college, uh, my college friends, we all joke about you know the things that come along with home ownership, and I want to join those ranks. So with me, this is a part of my asset development, saving long term, as well as going through the career field. I want to joke around with them and say, hey, we're starting to become our parents, just like in those commercials. This toolkit will definitely help refine the skills that I've already picked up, but it also will help others navigate pitfalls that can be quite daunting when going through your career, going through the career. I'm sorry, back to you, Andy. 
Thank you. Actually, I'm going to come back. Next. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Edward, Nancy, and Andy. Uh, I was part of helping to, to build this toolkit, though. Listening and watching as you went through it today, it, I just want to say, wow, all the tools and the resources that really do touch the five different stages from thinking about to retiring. And I'm with Nancy, we're around the same age and we're, we are looking to retire together. Uh, so just thank you all for you know walking through, but also including your professional and personal uh, lived experience to help us learn more about this new resource. And Edward, a special thank you to you for uh, taking us, allowing us to learn a little bit more about your financial journey and how you're addressing financial challenges and issues that you have. And the fact that this has allowed you to purchase a vehicle, very cool. So really, really appreciate that. We're going to go to the next slide, please. And then the next slide. So we just included uh, another little blurb here uh, about the financial toolkit. It includes a description along with the link to the website. We hope you obviously visit it often and please use your dissemination channels and social media to help promote it. I, I hope that you agree with us today that it has a lot to offer and a lot to share and, and we want to help get it out there. So thank you. Next slide. Well, we have a lot of questions and answers, uh, Andy, Nancy, and Edward, um, that we want to get to, and we have some time to answer them. So we're just going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to start with a question. Um, I think, Andy, I'm going to start with you and ask you, how is this toolkit then designed to address the needs of marginalized individuals? I think you touched on it a bit at the beginning, if you could just say a little more. Of course. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, team. Edward, I'm truly inspired by your story. And I really, you know, I hope to achieve home ownership in the very near future, too. So I just need to say that. And if you guys retire, uh, Nancy and Laura, I'm glad I have your personal contact information. <laughs> so I can ask you questions. Um, we developed this toolkit as um through the lens of marginalized or BIPOC communities. Like I said before, I'm Latinx. I grew up in systemic poverty. I actually grew up in foster care. So I really didn't know that having a job was a goal for me and let alone having a career or having uh, options for retirement. I always assumed that you needed to rely on only your social security to move forward. So within each resource, we've really looked at um, how other communities, BIPOC communities, would utilize this, whether it be translating some items in different languages, which you can find on different websites, right? Not essentially in the toolkit, but if you go to websites, there's certain uh, items that are translated into Spanish, but also the lived experience of an individual from a BIPOC community and how they would interpret the resources. This was very important to me. We're also doing a blog series down the road with this, uh, with this toolkit, and we're going to be uh, targeting on asking BIPOC members to really engage with us and tell us their financial story, as well as having a national dialogue where stakeholders and individuals can communicate with us about their needs and their experiences uh, with financial empowerment and how this toolkit can help them. Thank you, Andy. Certainly equity and inclusion was a big part of building this toolkit. And as Andy said, and helping to learn more about it as we move to the future. Thank you for that. Nancy, I'm going to direct this question to you. Uh, 
some people would like to know what are some of the other tools, resources uh, currently under developed or planned for the future? I know that Jennifer alluded to that at the beginning. So can you talk about some of what we're, what's in the works coming up? I sure can. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, so there's two things that I can think of off the top of my head. The first is um, a, a, a tool or a document that's called Aligning My Career Path with My Earning Needs. So, which, which I really like because rather than helping people find um, emergency jobs or you know, just a, a quick job, um, helping people who are in crisis, I think it's really important for people to start looking at where do I want to be? What type of job do I need to be in that apartment complex that's close to my job? Uh, what do I need to earn so that, you know, I can purchase that van that I've been saving for? So aligning a person's career path with their earning needs is one of the things that we're working on. And then a second one is what are my housing options? There are lots of options for folks with disabilities, lots of options for individuals with low to moderate income. So we're putting together a, I believe it's a one or a two page document with several resources um, on housing options for folks with disabilities. Great, thank you for that, Nancy. Uh, and as Jennifer said, we'll be developing new resources quarterly. So if you have any ideas, please feel free to put them in the chat and also when you fill out the post webinar uh, survey. And I know Edward, thank you, you had suggested quite a few as you had given some comments on the buckets. So I have a question that I want to, to look to all three of you and I'll start with Andy and Nancy. Uh, it, the question is, can you suggest some ways an AJC staff person or service provider can use this toolkit. And then uh, after Andy and Nancy have the chance, then we're gonna look to you, Edward, first as an individual who uses the toolkit. But I'll ask you that because I'll have something to add. So maybe Andy, I'll start with you. Could you suggest some ways that an AJC staff person or service provider could use the toolkit? Yeah, I think one of the greatest options on the toolkit is the search tool, honestly. I mean, a lot of American Job Center staff know about Jan, obviously, and think about the accommodations aspect. But I think the search tool in itself, when you're looking up healthcare or when you're looking up other items, you can easily find resources that would speak to the individual that you're serving. The other thing that I'd like to point out about this toolkit is that we've really made it uh, with universal language and sort of that in mind. So nothing is cumbersome. There isn't lots of language on each page. It really breaks it down so that anyone can use this toolkit. We can't say that for the secondary pages, but anything within the toolkit itself does have a universal language tone that makes it easy to navigate for wherever you are or whoever you're helping in the American Job Center. Great, thank you, Andy. Nancy, do you have some ways that you'd like to suggest for an AJC staff person or service provider uh, using the toolkit? Thanks, Laura. So um, I, I wanna say a couple things real quick because I wanna make sure we can get enough time for uh, lots of questions that I saw in, in chat and Q&A. Um, but the, the fact that this toolkit is geared towards financial capability, I think is really important. Um, so I think it gives another lens for AJCs to look through in terms of how they're focusing on folks with disabilities that they're serving um, and looking at it from that financial capability lens. And then I don't know if I was supposed to say this here or not, but um, we, we have a quick reference guide from the LEAD Center that's gonna be coming out, I wanna say in September. And what we're gonna be doing is um, talking about how AJCs can promote financial wellness 
for individuals with disabilities. So kind of stay tuned for that because I think that goes really well with, um, with the toolkit. Right. And Edler, does an individual need to use the toolkit with a service provider or could they use it on their own? They're more than able to use it on their own. Um, this toolkit was really designed to let them from the comfort of their own home and personal electronic device to allow them to search and, and you know increase their knowledge and confidence of these buckets. So it's very you know useful and you know just hands free. Okay, thank you uh, for that. So uh, another question: Will this toolkit be helpful to help determine or understand how working will impact benefits such as SSI or SSDI? And maybe Nancy, I'll turn to you. And I apologize, Laura, can you please repeat? Sure, that? sure. Will this toolkit be helpful to help determine or understand how working will impact benefits such as SSI or SSDI? Thank you, it will. Um, and I apologize, I started getting, I was looking at chat to see what kind of questions we had coming in. Um, yeah, absolutely. There are um, several resources specifically from the Social Security Administration um, that talk about what will happen um, with someone's benefits. And then one of the things that we really didn't focus a lot on because there's just so much information, great information on the toolkit are ABLE accounts. But that's uh, another way that individuals who receive SSI and or SSDI can earn income um, and, and have it you know, not necessarily affect their, their SSI and their Medicaid. So, um, but yes, there are definitely several tools that they can use. And again, as Andy said before, the search function is a great way to do that. Right. Uh, we already have somebody say that they're very much looking forward to the new housing resource when it becomes available. They're in an awful living situation, so stay tuned. So we're going to ask one more question, and it's, I work with a lot of people who already have bad credit scores. Are there specific tools that they can use or implement to begin the process of repairing their credit score? I'll look to Andy or Nancy. I would love to address that question. Okay, first. sure. Um, yes, there is. I am gonna be completely transparent with you and my credit score, I would say seven years ago was extremely low. I have no shame in sharing that. Um, and I always had to have a cosigner with, um, with anything that I purchased, any major uh, apartment or home or uh, not home, not yet, wishful thinking, right? But a car or anything like that, I needed a cosigner. So I started using the tools on CFPB um, website that we just went over a little bit. And it really helped me. <clears throat> understand how my credit score impacts everything, how to raise my credit score gradually. It's not gonna happen overnight, um, but there are some tools on their website to help you. Also, there's some good new apps that are out there. Credit Karma has been useful for me, not endorsing them in any way, but there are some technology apps that you can use to help you build your credit score. Um, so yes, there is a way out of the hole. Uh, I made it out and um, now I actually have a score of seven, uh, 700 plus, which as someone new from uh, the disability, I'm in a wheelchair and I'm Latinx. I never thought I could have a high credit score, but I think there are ways to build your credit successfully through this tool. Right, thank you. We have so many great questions and while we won't be able to get to them now, we're going to keep them. Many of them can inform uh, where the direction we take, the type of resources that we have, and also those that you asked about when we share uh, social media or tidbits about this then we will be able to include this. So we want to thank you for all the questions and interest. If we can go to the next slide, please. And 
For those of you who might not be connected to the LEAD Center, we do encourage you to follow us and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, this slide includes a link to the LEAD Center website where you can sign up to get information and notifications. Next slide, please. And here are some additional ways that you can connect with us. You can follow the LEAD Center via Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Next slide, please. So before we close, I really want to take this opportunity uh, and thank each of you for joining us today, beginning with our three representatives from the Department of Labor, uh, Secretary Walsh, the Acting Assistant Secretary Kawar, and uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Sheehy for really helping to open today's webinar and to officially launch the Financial Toolkit. And I can't say enough to our wonderful presenters, Edward, Nancy, and Andy, uh, especially Edward, you know, for introducing and navigating us through this toolkit using both your professional and personal lived experience. Just uh, appreciation. And finally, to all of you for joining us today. Uh, we really hope to see you again during upcoming Lead Center webinars, and you can learn more about them if you go to our website and uh, sign up. So thank you again, everybody. This concludes today's webinar. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day.